What is Protestantism? Protestantism is a principle. It is anti-rebellion. It is a protest against tyranny. It is protagonist. Tyranny, on the other hand, is that principle which, by rebellion against God, puts one man or confederation of men in the place of God over others. It is antagonist. It is antichrist. In a word, Protestantism is revived Christianity. We see the supreme example of this protest by our King Jesus himself when he laid down his own life in protest against the law of sin and death, a tyranny imposed by the very adversary of mankind. We see this protest carried on by the first martyr Stephen. The early Christians protested, Caesar is not Lord, and paid with their lives. Hundreds of millions have since protested, I cannot recant, and paid with their lives by fire, axe, and sword. When Jesus said, I came not to bring peace, the principle he introduced was Protestantism. We will now continue our journey into the history of Protestantism. Welcome back. You're listening to Cross the Border. In this uh, segment, we're going through the history of Protestantism. We're in Volume 1 and Book 1, Chapter 6, The Waldenses and Their Valleys. When Claude died, it can hardly be said that his mantle was taken up by anyone. The battle, although not altogether dropped, was henceforward languidly maintained. Before this time, not a few churches beyond the Alps had submitted to the yoke of Rome, and that arrogant power must have felt it not a little humiliating to find her authority withstood on what she might regard as her own territory. She was venerated abroad, but contemned at home. Attempts were renewed to induce the bishops of Milan to accept the Episcopal Paul, the badge of spiritual vassalage, from the Pope. But it was not until the middle of the 11th century, 1059, under Nicholas II, that these attempts were successful. Petrus Damianus, Bishop of Ostia, and Anselm, Bishop of Lucca, were dispatched by the pontiff to receive the submission of the Lombard churches. And the popular tumult of which that submission was extorted sufficiently show that the spirit of Claude still lingered at the foot of the Alps. Nor did the clergy conceal their regret with which they laid their ancient liberties at the feet of a power before which the whole earth was then bowing down. For the Papal legate Damianus informs us that the clergy of Milan maintained in his presence that the Ambrosian Church, according to the ancient institutions of the Fathers, was always free, without being subject to the laws of Rome, and that the Pope of Rome had no jurisdiction over their Church as to the government or constitution of it. But if the plains were conquered, not so the mountains. A considerable body of protesters stood out against this deed of submission. Of these, some crossed the Alps, descended the Rhine, and raised the standard of opposition to the Diocese of Cologne, where they were branded as Manicheans and rewarded with the stake. Others retired into their valleys of the Piedmont Alps and there maintained their scriptural faith and their ancient independence. And we have just related respecting the Diocese of Milan in Turin, settles the question, in our opinion, of the apostolicity of the churches of the Waldensian valleys. It is not necessary to show that missionaries were sent from Rome in the first age to plant Christianity in these valleys, nor is it necessary to show that these churches have existed as distinct and separate communities from early days. Enough that they formed a part, as unquestionably they did, of the great evangelical church of the north of Italy. This is the proof at once of their apostolicity and their independence. It attests their descent from apostolic men, if, 
doctrine be the life of the churches. When their co-religionists on the plains entered within the pale of the Roman jurisdiction, they retired within the mountains, and, spurning alike the tyrannical yoke and the corrupt tenets of the Church of the Seven Hills, they preserved in its purity and simplicity the faith of their fathers that were handed down to them. Rome, manifestly, was the schismatic. She it was that had abandoned what was once the common faith of Christendom, leaving by that step to all who remained on the old ground the indisputably valid title of the true church. Behind this rampart of mountains, which Providence, foreseeing the approach of evil days, would almost seem to have reared on purpose, did the remnant of the early apostolic church of Italy kindle their lamp. And here did that lamp continue to burn all through the long night which descended on Christendom. There's a singular concurrence of evidence in favor of their high antiquity. Their traditions invariably point to an unbroken descent from the earliest times as regards their religious belief. The Nobla Lesson, which dates from the year 1100, goes to prove that the Waldenses of Piedmont did not owe their rise to Peter Waldo of Leon, who did not appear till the later half of that century, 1160. The Nobla Lesson, though a poem, is in reality a confession of faith and could have been composed only after some considerable study of the system of Christianity, in contradistinction to the errors of Rome. How could a church have arisen with such a document in their hands? Or how could these herdsmen and vine dressers, shut up in their mountains, have detected the errors against which they bore testimony and found their way to the truths of which they made open profession in times of darkness like these? If we grant that their religious beliefs were the heritage of former ages, handed down from an evangelical ancestry, all is plain, but if we maintain that they were the discovery of men of those days, we assert what approaches almost to a miracle. Their greatest enemies, Claude Sisel of Turin, 1517, and Rhinarius the Inquisitor, 1250, we have admitted their antiquity and stigmatized them as the most dangerous of all heretics because the most ancient. Orenco, prior of St. Rock, Turin, 1640, was employed to investigate the origin and antiquity of the Waldenses, and, of course, had access to all the Waldensian documents in the ducal archives, and, being their bitter enemy, he may be presumed to have made his report not more favorable than he could help. Yet he states that they were not a new sect in the ninth and 10th centuries, and that Claude of Turin must have detached them from the church in the ninth century. Within the limits of their own land did God provide a dwelling for this venerable church. Let us bestow a glance upon the region. As one comes from the south, across the level plain of Piedmont, while yet nearly a hundred miles off, he sees the Alps rise before him, stretching like a great wall along the horizon. From the gates of the morning to those of the setting sun, the mountains run in a line of towering magnificence. Pastures and chestnut forests clothe their base. Eternal snows crown their summits. How varied are their forms! Some rise strong and massy as castles, others shoot up tall and tapering like needles, while others again run along in serrated lines, their summits torn and cleft by the storms of many thousand winters. At the hour of sunrise, what a glory kindles along the crest of that snowy rampart. At sunset, the spectacle is again renewed and a line of pyres is seen to burn in the evening sky. Drawing nearer to the hills, on a line about 30 miles west of Turin, 
there opens before one what seems a great mountain portal. This is the entrance to the Waldensian territory. A low hill drawn along in front serves as a defense against all who may come with hostile intent, as but too frequently happened in times gone by. While a stupendous monolith, the Castelluzzo shoots up to the clouds and stands sentinel at the gate of this renowned region. As one approaches La Torre, the Castelluzzo rises higher and higher and irresistibly fixes the eye by the perfect beauty of its pillar-like form. But to this mountain a higher interest belongs than any that mere symmetry could give it. It is indissolubly linked with martyr memories, and borrows a halo from the achievements of the past. How often, in days of old, was the confessor hurled sheer down its awful steep and dashed on the rocks at its foot, and there commingled in one ghastly heap, growing ever bigger and more ghastly as another and yet another victim was added to it lay the mangled bodies of pastor and peasant, mother and child. It was the tragedies connected with this mountain mainly that called forth Milton's well-known sonnet. Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints, whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold. In thy book record their groans, who were thy sheep, and in their ancient fold, slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled, mother with infant down the rocks, their moans, the veils redoubled to the hills, and they to heaven. The elegant temple of the Waldenses rises near the foot of the Castelluzzo. The Waldensian valleys are seven in number. They were more in ancient times, but the limits of the Vaudwa territory have undergone repeated curtailment, and now only the number we have stated remain, lying between Pinerolo on the east and Monteviso on the west, that pyramidal hill which forms so prominent an object from every part of the plain of Piedmont, towering as it does above the surrounding mountains, and like a horn of silver cutting the ebon of the firmament. The first three valleys run out somewhat like the spokes of a wheel, the spot on which we stand, the gateway, namely, being the nave. The first is Lucerna, or Valley of Light. It runs out in a grand gorge of some twelve miles in length by about two in width. It wears a carpeting of meadow, which the waters of the palace keep ever fresh and bright. A profusion of vines, acacias, and mulberry trees fleck it with their shadows, and a wall of lofty mountains encloses it on either hand. The second is Rora, or Valley of Dews. It is a vast cup, some fifty miles in circumference, its sides luxuriantly clothed with meadows and cornfields, with fruit, and forests, trees, and its rim formed of craggy and spiky mountains, many of them snow-clad. The third is Angragna, or Valley of Groans. Of it we shall speak more particularly afterward. Beyond the extremity of the first three valleys are the remaining four, forming, as it were, the rim of a wheel. The last are enclosed in their turned by a line of lofty and craggy mountains which form a wall of defense around the entire territory. Each valley is a fortress, having its own gate of ingress and egress, with its caves and rocks and mighty chestnut trees forming places of retreat and shelter, so that the highest engineering skills could not have better adapted each several valley to its end. It is not less remarkable Taking all these valleys together, each is so related to each, and the one opens so into the other, that they might be said to form one fortress of amazing and matchless strength, wholly impregnable, in fact, all the fortresses of Europe, though combined, would not form a citadel so enormously strong 
and so dazzlingly magnificent as the mountain dwelling of the Vaudois. The Eternal, our God, says Lager, having destined this land to be the theater of his marvels and the bulwark of his ark, has, by natural means, most marvelously fortified it. The battle begun in one valley could be continued to another and carried round the entire territory, till at last the invading foe, overpowered by rocks, rolled upon him from the mountains, or assailed by enemies, which would start suddenly out of the mist or issue from some unsuspected cave, found retreat impossible, and cut off in detail, left his bones to whiten the mountains he had come to subdue. These valleys are lovely and fertile, as well as strong. They are watered by numerous torrents, which descend from the snows of the summits, the grassy carpet of their bottom, the mantling vine and golden grain of their lower slopes, the chalets that dot their sides, sweetly embowered amid fruit trees, and higher up the great chestnut forests and the pasture lands where the herdsmen keep watch over their flocks all through the summer days and the starlit nights, the nodding crags from which the torrent leaps into the light, the rivulet singing with quiet gladness in the shady nook, the mists moving grandly among the mountains, now veiling, now revealing their majesty, and the far-off summits tipped with silver, to be changed at eve into gleaming gold, make up a picture of blended beauty and grandeur, not equaled, perhaps, and certainly not surpassed, in any other region of the earth. In the heart of their mountains is situated the most interesting, perhaps, of all their valleys. It was in this retreat, walled round by hills whose heads touched heaven, that their barbs, or pastors, with all their several parishes were wont to meet in annual synod. It was here that their college stood, and it was here that their missionaries were trained, and after ordination were sent forth to sow the good seed, as opportunity offered, in other lands. Let us visit this valley. We ascend to it by the long, narrow, and winding agrogna, Bright meadows enliven its entrance. The mountains on either side are clothed with the vine, the mulberry, and the chestnut. Anon the valley contracts. It becomes rough with projecting rocks and shady with great trees. A few paces farther and expands into a, a circular basin, feathery with birches, musical with falling waters, environed atop by naked crags, fringed with dark pines, while the white peak looks down upon one out of heaven. A little advanced, the valley seems shut in by a mountainous wall, drawn right across it, and beyond, towering sublimely upward, is seen the assemblage of the snow-clad Alps, amid which is placed the valley we are in quest of, where burned of old the candle of the Waldenses, some terrible convulsion has rent this mountain from top to bottom, opening a path through it to the valley beyond. We enter the dark chasm and proceed along the narrow ledge in the mountain side, hung halfway between the torrent, which is heard thundering in the abyss below, and the summits which lean over us. Journeying thus for about two miles, we find the pass beginning to widen the light to break in, and now we arrive at the gate of the pra. There opens before us a noble circular valley, its grassy bottom watered by torrents, its side dotted with dwellings and clothed with cornfields and pastures, while a ring of white peaks guards it from above. This was the inner sanctuary of the Waldensian temple. The rest of Italy had turned aside to idols. The Waldensian territory alone had been reserved for the worship of the true God. And was it not meet that on its native soil a remnant of the Apostolic Church of Italy should be maintained? 
that Rome and all Christendom might have before their eyes a perpetual monument of what they themselves had once been, and a living witness to testify how far they had departed from their first faith. You're listening across the border, and we've been going through the history of Protestantism. So ends chapter 6 of volume 1 and part 1. Next time, uh, we'll jump into chapter 7, the Waldenses, their missions, and their martyrdoms. So make sure you come back for that. May the Almighty bless you and keep you until we meet again. The book of Revelation says, The spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is at the very heart of FirstAmendmentRadio.com. In that spirit, we have created the Prophecy Reality News app for all of your mobile devices. Streaming First Amendment Radio 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Available for your Apple, Android device, and smartphone absolutely free. Get the Prophecy Reality News app installed today so you can listen to First Amendment Radio wherever you are. The Prophecy Reality News app. Get it now. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a Third Temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossTheBorder.org to get your print, 
EPUB or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.